Hi, I'm Mark and I'm a director at Global Fire Creative. I'm going to show you some ways that we've used green screen recently, how to go about using it, as well as our favourite bits of kit to give you an idea of how useful and flexible it can be. We shoot a lot of pieces to camera for our corporate clients. Green screen allows us to inject a bit of creativity and interest into an otherwise standard, dare we say it, boring video. We'll talk about what we do post-production in the second part of this video, but for now, let's look at the most important bit of this setup, lighting. Lighting is always important, but with green screen, we have more margin for error if we get it wrong. Poor lighting can make it much harder to key out the green in post-production, or if it doesn't match the background, then the keyed footage will look out of place. Here we have our very own Alice in our studio against the green screen. We've got her lit without any spill, thanks to our lighting setup. We like to use two four foot light banks to light the green area. It's important that we get it as evenly lit as possible as this will make it easier in post-production. And we can check this using the waveform on the camera's monitor. What we're after is an even distribution of green with no dark or light spots. We have two hairline lights hitting our subject from behind in order to reduce any reflections or spill from the green. Lastly, a nice key light with plenty of diffusion and a kicker or fill light to offset shadows ensures our subject is exposed properly and evenly. We use either an LED light panel or if we need some more light, some 650 watt Aries. Of course, not all green screen shoots are just pieces to camera, so a three point lighting setup isn't always going to look right. If you're shooting something that will be composited into a background plate, it's vital to match the lighting to that background. For example, if the sun is coming from the top left of frame, you'll need to light your subject from the same place, and probably not use any hairlines. You'll still need to light the green evenly though. We shot this music video for Koshin, entirely on green screen in one day in our studio. When shooting something that's going to heavily rely on post-production, you need to make sure your camera is getting as much information as possible from a high bitrate and using decent chroma subsampling. Why does that matter? A bit is the smallest container of information in any software. In camera technology, it's colour information. Have you ever wondered why in an image of a clear blue sky you sometimes see colour banding? That's because it's probably 8-bit. You won't see anywhere near as much in 10-bit. Without going too much into the maths, an 8-bit image can represent 256 shades of luminance brightness per RGB channel, whereas a 10-bit image has far more at 1024, so your camera can better represent all those different gradients in those sky blues, or the greens of a green screen. What about chroma subsampling? The human eye is much more sensitive to luma differences than colour, so as a way to compress image sizes, less colour information is picked up by the camera's sensor, with clever maths filling in the gaps. On a group of four horizontal and two vertical pixels, 8-bit 420 footage records colour from two of the top row and zero from the second. 10-bit 422 records two pixels from the top and bottom. 444 footage records colour from every pixel, so there's no chroma subsampling. The more colour being recorded makes keying green screen much easier, particularly as it picks up much more detail around the edges of a subject. Lastly, what's the difference between a long GOP and die frame codec? GOP stands for group pictures, and it refers to the way a codec compresses footage. The camera records the first frame complete and whole, and then using a formula, it predicts the next frame. This formula will be different for every codec, and in turn, camera manufacturer, which is one of the reasons for the Canon or Sony look. The frame after that is also predicted, with the one after looking at the frames before, and looking back to the complete frame to make sure it hasn't strayed from the original image, and it then predicts the next frame. This sequence of predictive frames will be 7 for PAL or 15 for NTSC. At the end of the sequence, a new complete frame is recorded and the whole process starts again. The benefits of this cleverness is much smaller file sizes than if each frame had been recorded complete in an iframe codec. The downsides come in the edit, as each time a cut is made to the footage, your editing software has to recreate that sequence behind the scenes, creating a new complete frame where you made that cut. This is why older machines can often struggle with compressed codecs such as H.264. With iframe, reconstruction isn't necessary, so your machine won't be working as hard. This can be important for post-intensive workloads and when you need every individual frame captured, like for green screen and VFX work. We use Sony FS7s for the majority of our work. It's a flexible camera, both at home on location, run and gun style, or set up in the studio. 
It's got the ability to record internally 4K at 8 bit 420 in the XAVC L codec or 10 bit 422 with XAVCI. If you've got a beefy edit setup with plenty of fast storage space, then you can record up to 12 bit RAW with an additional adapter, which would of course give you a chroma subsampling of 444. However, unless you're shooting for really high end, like cinema, then this bump up in quality is not usually worth the added cost. We usually shoot in an S-Log3 picture profile, with the benefit being more dynamic range, giving us more flexibility with the whites and blacks in post. The more information retained in a higher bit codec allows us to push the footage more in the edit. However, it can slow down your workflow due to the higher file sizes and more computing power needed. We find that if you set up your shot properly, then 10-bit or perhaps even 8-bit codecs will be absolutely fine. A green screen isn't just a stand-in for the action. If you make it portable, it can get right where the action is happening. We shot an ad for a theme park's new dinosaur attraction last year. Now, we're a small team working from a relatively small studio. We can't fit dinosaurs, jeeps and a crew of actors all under one roof. So shooting outside against a portable green screen allows us more room for action and those all important special effects. The challenges are also greater. Lighting can be harder to control. Space can also be an issue. When using green screen, you don't want your subjects to be too close to the green as it can cause shadows. This can be a problem as the difference in light will make it harder to keep. This is easier to control with more room, but you do have to be mindful of getting that distance just right. Great natural light can do most of the work for you, but we shot this during a particularly sunny day, so we needed to diffuse the light a little to ensure it remained even. In this case, as the background footage is outdoor, we can allow the natural light to do most of the work for us. The shoot on any project is often only half the work, and that's especially true when using a green screen. The differences between this and this are impressive, right? You know a green screen project has been successful when your disbelief is suspended just enough that you forget a green screen has even been used. As we discussed before, the setup, lighting and equipment used is key to ensuring this success. But this goes hand in hand with what goes on in the editing suite. Let's have a look. We do most of our post-production work in the Adobe Creative Suite. Colour or chroma keying is the term used to describe the technique of removing a colour, usually green or blue, from an image. Now you can key in Premiere Pro, which has got pretty decent in recent years for this kind of work, but we do all our keying in After Effects as we find it gives us much more control and generally gives better results. It's also much more powerful as a compositing tool which is the process of pulling multiple bits of footage, images and graphics together to form one clip. This is when the quality of the footage you've got makes a difference. Lower resolution and more compressed footage will be harder to key as there is less detail saved within the video file. As you can see here in this highly compressed shot of Alice, the lack of detail in the dark spots and hairlines makes it difficult for the software to get a good key. And in this shot where the green wasn't lit evenly, it's going to be really hard to remove any green at all. You can also see the difference between an 8-bit and 10-bit image with the colour banding across this part of the green. So let's look at the less compressed 10-bit footage of Alice we shot in the first video. First thing we do is create an edit of the shots we need. Once we've got that, we can begin keying. We create a mask around the subject, leaving enough room for any movement, but getting rid of anything in the shot that doesn't need to be there, such as lighting stands or the edge of the green screen. It also reduces the amount of pixels the editing software is working with, reducing the processing power needed. Depending on the final output, we sometimes apply a simple grade now, crunching the blacks a tad and increasing the saturation a bit. Now I'll quickly run through our usual process for keying. There is no set way to do this, but we found this method works well for our needs. First I change the background of the composition to magenta, which is the opposite of green on a colour wheel, as this will better highlight any missed green later. Then I apply a colour key and increase the tolerance to as far as it can go before it starts to key the subject. I may need to apply multiple colour keys depending on how well lit the background is. Next I put on a simple choker, reducing the value so that I get a green outline around the subject. Now I apply the key light effect and select a green pixel closest to the subject as that's where a missed bit of green will be most noticeable. There's a lot of tweaks and options within here to fine tune the key. Using the screen map view, the black areas show me what's being removed and the white is what remains. I can increase the black level and reduce the white to a point where it's getting rid of all the green. I'll now finely tune the edges with some edge blur and softness, as well as adding a few other tweaks here and there. All of these tweaks will differ each time depending on how the footage was shot, so be prepared to play around with them until you get to where you need to be. 
Once I've got to where I'm happy with it, I add a spill suppressor to help alleviate any green spill around the edges of the subject. Now that I've got a good key, I can composite the footage into whatever I like, and then apply an overall grade to finish the composite off. We at Global Fire love to work with green screen. The creative possibilities are endless, and with the right know-how, anyone can have a piece of that. We hope these examples of our own work have given you a good idea of how this classic film trickery isn't just for the movies. Thanks for watching, and for more filmmaking tips, news and reviews, and for more info on any of the kit you've seen us use, head over to wex.co.uk. Thank you.